Lauren Slater is an American psychologist and the author of nine books, including Opening Skinner's Box, which recounts a number of the most important psychological experiments of the 20th century, as well as The Beautiful Prozac Diary, wherein she recounts her profound early experiences with the medication. Following somewhat in that vein, her new title, Blue Dreams, is about the psychiatric drugs millions of us take in this country, the science behind them, the medical and pharmaceutical companies making them, as well as the humanity behind those taking them. And not only are there innumerable new insights into an industry and a movement shaping so much of our society's thoughts, but her willingness to continue to open up about a subject that so many of us shut down because of, and to continue to use her own personal struggles to illuminate and inhabit her work is in admirable and invaluable. Tonight she'll be in conversation with Olga Hazan, a staff writer at The Atlantic, where she covers health, gender, and science. So ladies and gentlemen, please help me in giving a warm welcome to Olga Hazan and Lawrence Slater. Okay. Um, well, thank you guys so much for coming out. Is this is this on or is it? Oh, it's good. Okay. Cool. Um, so yeah. So tell us a little bit about why you decided to write this book. Um. It. it I, I didn't. It wasn't like a single decision. I had been talking with my agent, and um, I said I had an idea, a vague idea for a book. Um. Well, I wrote a book called opening Skinner's box, Great Psychological Experiments of the 20th Century. And in that book, every experiment that was, I made into a narrative, a story. And I wanted to see if I could do the same thing for medications, if I could find the story behind psychiatry's um, most seminal drugs, the drugs that have had the biggest impact on psychiatry. I couldn't include all of them, though. So my, that's, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to find out. Um, I wanted to make Thorazine and lithium and the Prozac and all the SSRIs and placebos and all that into, into stories. Who, how did they come into being? Who created them? What are the controversies? What are, what are the things that we don't know or don't say? Um, so that was, uh, so yeah, I want, I, I'm, most, I'm a storyteller, so I wanted to find the stories and that's what drove me to write the book. And, and so walk us through some of the, the dark days. What, what was psychiatric treatment like before we had medications? What were people trying to do in order to help people with severe mental illnesses get better? Um, well, I actually wouldn't necessarily call what we did before medications the dark days um, because what I found out in writing this book is that mental illness throughout history has been primarily seen as a biological phenomenon. Psychoanalysis and psychotherapy, talk therapy, those are the oddities. Those, there's just a brief blip in time when for a while Sigmund Freud got a hold of us and we started to think about our ids and egos and super egos. Um, and we began to believe that we could cure ourselves through language. That is the odd thing that but because for most of history we have approached uh, mental illness in strictly somatic terms before thorazine and lithium were discovered um, in 1903 or 4 the barbiturates were discovered so those were used morphine was legal and was sold in syrups and tonics. And there was a syrup called Mrs. Winslow's Soothing Syrup that you could give your colicky baby. I mean, you're, you, they would give babies morphine. Um, they would also give people who are suffering severe depressions or schizophrenia or whatever morphine. They, and then there were uh, the more, you know, d the, the treatments that do actually seem dark. They had something called metrazole therapy where um, the person would in, inhale, I can't remember exactly what it is, but they would inhale a substance that caused huge panic in a person. The person would, it was awful. Patients would be taken to that kind of therapy, kicking and screaming. They were so terrified of it. Um, and the, the person would go into a complete 100% dreadful panic attack and then fall into a coma and the hope was that the coma would somehow restore the imbalance in their brain and when they woke up they would be sane again so that was the same they did the same thing with insulin actually they would give patients they would shoot patients up with huge amounts of insulin the person would go into a uh, a coma um, and then they would um, 
reverse the coma by injecting the patient with like something like orange juice or something really sugary. And again, it was thought that the coma would somehow reset the brain. There was something called deep sleep therapy, which is along the same lines as these coma therapies. Um, they would, uh, using barbiturates and morphine and a kind of cocktail of, of sort of, you know, dreamy drugs, they would send patients to, into sleep for as long as six or six weeks, two months. Um, patients died actually in doing deep sleep therapy. It sounds harmless, but um, your lungs, get, you know, your lungs start to fill up with fluid if you're not moving. And um, so deep sleep therapy was, was something else that they did electroconvulsive therapies, um, I think came about in 1933. Um, and then there were, we've all heard of lobotomies, and those that was discovered by Egas Moniz in 1941, I think, or 1945. Moniz actually couldn't do the lobotomies because he had something wrong with his hands. He had some kind of rheumatitis or something like that. He had his assistant do the lobotomies, which were actually in the early days done by injecting alcohol into the brain. The alcohol literally burned the brain and burned away brain tissue. And then later they developed something called a leucotome, which is like an ice pick that goes in either in through the temple or up under the eye. Um, and you sort of whisk it around in the brain. Um, and voila, it's, um, it became, it then, uh, eventually, lobotomies came to our side of the sea. They were done in Europe. And um, a doctor by the name of Walter Freeman became so enamored of lobotomies that he started, he would do maybe 50 in a day. He actually would um, rented motels around the country. Um, and patients would come one at a time, lie down, um, he'd stick an ice pick up through their eyes, swish the blade around, and then they were sent off back home. Um, so I, I guess those, yeah, we don't do that anymore, although we do, <laughs> we do do something called the cingulotomy, which is um, a, a, more, a finer, a more refined version of a lobotomy. You won't, it's very rare that this is done, but it is, if you are at the end of your rope, literally, and you've tried everything um, and nothing has, has helped and you have depression or an, either depression or anxiety, you can't do a lobotomy or a cingulotomy for someone with schizophrenia. It's, just, it's not going to work. Um, but you can actually, in today's day and age, get a cingulotomy at Mass General Hospital in Boston where they will go into your brain and take out some of your brain tissue. Um, the thing to remember, though, I just want to say, because you, you use the phrase dark days, lobotomies were, yes, they were bad, but they also helped some people. So you're saying they worked? They actually they at, well, they worked and they didn't work, just the way our drugs today work and don't work sometimes. Uh -huh. You know, some people are cured and other people are racked with side effects. Um, but they did, but lobotomies did work for a number of people. There was a man named Harry Drucker who in 1938 published an article in the Coronet saying, the headline was, my lobotomy cured me. There was a, a war pilot who had a lobotomy. Um, he became so depressed that he couldn't fly anymore. He couldn't concentrate on what, he was just, he was completely destroyed by depression, he had a lobotomy and returned to flying um, with great success. There was a violinist who was extremely talented, became again decimated by depression, had a lobotomy and returned to be a virtuoso violinist traveling all around the world. Mm -hmm. So um, those aren't just a few stories. Lobotomies did help um, a number of people, but they also did, you know, hurt a number of people too. Um, it's just, it's never clear. It's not like it was dark back then and now we're in the light. Um, right. So, I mean, I think it's been sort of dusk the whole way through. <laughs> what about, what about Thorazine? Why was that so important to psychiatry? Um, Thorazine was so important to psychiatry because, well, technically, lithium was discovered before Thorazine. Lithium was discovered in 1949 by John Cade, but it didn't actually get any press until the late 50s. Thorazine was, um, was starting to be used in the early 1950s, and it was psychiatry's first 
medication. Psychiatry wanted, has always wanted to be seen as a scientific slash medical discipline. The only problem is there's no disease tissue that psychiatry can look at and say, there it is, there's depression. You can't put depression in a bottle, you can't smear it on a slide and look at it under a microscope. There's absolutely nothing about our fleshy selves that psychiatry can get its hooks into to say, here's where the illness lives. But Thorazine suggested, because it was so remarkable, people, schizophrenics who had been comatose uh, um, for, not comatose, but who had been like in frozen positions, um, catatonic for years and years, suddenly just stopped. They stopped uh, adopting weird poses and started to just talk. Um, and there was a juggler who, well, they didn't know he was a juggler because he was so ill. They put him on Thorazine and the next day he's throwing three balls in the air and saying he was a juggler and he'd like to go home. Um, <laughs> There was a barber from Lyon who, again, they didn't know he was a barber, but once he was put on Thorazine, he quickly came out of his schizophrenia and said he was a barber, and his doctor said, all right, if you're really a barber, then um, give me a shave. And so the nurses bought, brought a bowl of water, and this was a pretty intrepid psychiatrist, I have to say, because this guy was really nuts. I mean... Um, but the, he got a really good shave from this patient, and the patient was released. Um, it, was, it seemed like a miracle drug to people. Um, it was actually touted as psychiatry's penicillin. It was um, people who had been absolutely unreachable suddenly became reachable. And the impl so that was a miracle, but the implication was that mental illness because something chemical was curing mental illness, therefore mental illness must indeed be something chemical. Hmm. And that's what was so important about Thorazine to the treatment providers. They were like, see, we're real doctors here. Um, psychiatrists are, you know, even today, like, you know, they don't really necessarily feel like they're real doctors. They're paid less than other doctors. And they, there's a lot of insecurity in the profession and back then, Thorazine was something that psychiatrists could hold up and say, you know, we, we really are doing something real. We've cured it with a chemical, so it must be because of a chemical. I want to skip ahead in time a little bit and, and kind of zoom in on, on your personal story. So you write a lot about SSRIs, um, mm -hmm. and they're one of the most widely prescribed drugs. Uh, so you're you're a psychologist, right? Yes, and, I'm a psychologist. And do you see do you see patients currently? Yes. So what are some of the most? I mean, are, are a lot of your patients on SSRIs right now? Um, I would say about half. Okay. Are on SSRIs. What are some of the most common misconceptions that you run into around SSRIs? Probably the most common misconception that I run into is that people have been told when they're given an SSRI that they, the reason that an SSRI stands for select, ser, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. Um, and what people are told when they're given the drug is that they have low serotonin and that the drug is going to allow more serotonin to remain for a longer time in what's called the synaptic cleft in your brain. Basically, it's going to boost the levels of serotonin in your brain. And people believe this. Um, and I mean, Eli Lilly has, you know, posters showing, the, you know, the, the serotonin swimming in the cleft. Um, and what people don't know, though, is that there's no evidence at all that meant that depression or anxiety, which the SSRIs treat, there's no evidence that, that depression or anxiety is linked to serotonin. Um, they've looked and they've looked, you know, hard to see if they can find a, um, a, uh, even a correlation between serotonin and depression and anxiety, and they haven't been able to. Um, They've tested the cerebral spinal fluid of people with depression and anxiety and people without depression and anxiety, and they haven't, some people without depression and anxiety have low serotonin in their cerebral spinal fluid. Some people have high serotonin. Some depressed people have a lot of serotonin and some depressed people have low serotonin. So there's no, there's no crossover. Um, 
And I forgot what your original question oh, was. Oh, just that was going on. Yeah. But I mean, so 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 we don't really know why they work, but they work two thirds of the time, right? These SSRIs. Um, one third of the time they work like really well, and people on them are resume their their previous lives, the lives they had before they became ill. One third of the time they work somewhat well, and people sort of limp along like they're they're able to go to work and have relationships and but they're still hurting um and one third of the time they don't work at all what what have ssris done for you personally um well for me personally i was put on prozac um back when it first came out in 1987 um and i had um, extreme depression and obsessive compulsive disorder as well and um, I didn't believe that the drug was going to help me at all because prior to Prozac I had been on a drug called imipramine which is a tricyclic and it didn't do anything for me at all so and and back then in 1987 drug therapy was not something that was very common um, so I was like or I, I agreed to take it with thinking that it, you know, that nothing was going to come of it. Um, and within like three days, my obsessions, my the obsessive thinking that so plagued me, just kind of faded out. Um, and within probably five to six days, the severe depression that I had experienced. Um, also started to fade out. You notice it a little bit and then a little, and you think, am I imagining this? And then a little bit more, and then pretty soon it becomes impossible to, you know, you, you know it's the medic that the medication is working and there's a huge difference. Um, I mean, I say, you know, that Prozac, going on to Prozac um, for me was one of the most probably the most miraculous thing that has ever happened to me. It's more miraculous than having two children, which is pretty miraculous. Um, I mean, all of a sudden, I mean, I had been plagued with mental illness for since I was a very young child. And then all of a sudden, having your world, um, not having, um, all of a sudden, the mental illness is just after uh, years of therapy and trying and trying in therapy. My, my, my psychiatrist was like, "It's all because of your mother." Um, so for years, I talked about my mother, and like the the implication was, or it was even overtly stated, that if I could just get in touch with my rage about my less than nurturing mother, I would be healed. So like I tried really hard because you know I was sort of wanted to be a good student. And I tried to have these catharsis, uh, cathartic moments that were supposedly going to heal me. And instead, I just got worse and worse, which is oftentimes what happens as you age, the illness gets w worse and worse. My psychiatrist was of the psychoanalytic school. So she just, you know, she didn't think that there was anything really chemical going on with me. But um, to all of a sudden have a world where you're plagued with symptoms and where you can't do even the simplest thing, all of a sudden to be cured of that, it's like, um, I mean, I wrote the book Prozac Diary not because I wanted to talk about mental illness. I didn't want to talk about mental illness in Prozac Diary. I wanted to talk about mental health and how weird it was. Um, like cure, being cured, is is a great thing but it's also very complex it's it's uh, picture someone who's blind who all of a sudden is given back sight who's never seen before who's always been blind and then there's he's cured and he can see i mean everything would look bizarre you wouldn't know i mean it would take a long time to acclimate for the brain to acclimate to that kind of you know huge you know metamorphosis um it was similar with Prozac. I was I was really sort of lost. I was well, but I was lost. I didn't know what to do with myself. Or, and then of course the fear of that it was going to go away. Um, I had I was I was blessed with this like extremely robust, um, good you know good mood. Um, and after a while, I, I, when I got my bearings, I, I decided I liked it a lot better than, you know, the depression and the OCD. And then there was the fear that it's not going, it wasn't going to last. Um, and that's a fear that's continued 
you know, I, I, I don't know how long I have, you know. So, I mean, and you write that, that sometimes they do stop working, that the drugs that have worked for a while will stop working for people. Why, why does that happen? I mean, that's that's so uh, that must be crushing when it does happen. Yeah, it happened actually to me. Um, I felt so good that I decided I was going to start to travel because I'd never gone anywhere uh, because I was too ill. Um, I mean, I was hospitalized most of the time. And so I decided I was going to go to Kentucky um, to Appalachia to hear mountain women tell their stories. And so I packed up my car and I went, um, stoked on 20 milligrams of Prozac and, and right in the middle of, you know, these mountain women's tales, my, the Prozac just stopped working. Um, and that can, and they, the psychiatrists call it the poop out problem. Um, and they don't know why it is that your brain develops what is essentially a tolerance to the medication. Um, but it happens, I forget the exact statistic, but it, it happens, it's not uncommon for it to happen. In fact, I, I raised my dose and I got back, I got my really robust response back, but then I had to raise my dose again and again and again over a period of 10 or 20 years, um, more like 10 or 15 years. And eventually I had to go off Prozac because I was taking 120 milligrams of it, which is much more than what the FDA deems to be safe. Um, and I went on another, I went on what's called a selective serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor called Defexor. I went on that, but that needed to be boosted with an antipsychotic called Zyprexa, which is like a great drug, but it kills you. I mean, it's, it's, it, it, the side effects are, are truly deathly. It causes diabetes, enormous weight gain, dangerously high triglycerides. You're looking, at, if you're on Zyprexa, you're looking at a foreshortened life. Wow. So yeah, so I mean, you mentioned those are some of the, the downsides. Um, I was also really interested, you, you spent a, a long time in the book talking about uh, the story of a woman who had really severe sexual side effects with SSRIs. And I, I had never kind of read the explanation of why that happens. Can you kind of explain how those sexual side effects happen for so many people? Well, it's thought that sexual, that libido or arousal and you know the whole sexual spectrum is mediated by the dopamine system in our brain. Um, when you raise dopamine levels, um, people feel more sexually aroused. And when you dampen them, people um, don't feel aroused anymore. Um, ser uh, the SSRIs raise serotonin, but in the process they dampen dopamine. So. Um, your sex drive gets effectively wiped out. In the initial packaging of the SS of Prozac, it was said that, Eli Lilly said that one to 2% of people would have sexual side effects. I don't know if the, the package still says that. I hope not because that is blatantly untrue. Most people who are on a serotonin, serotonin boosting drug will have sexual side effects. Not everybody, but like 98% of people will. 98%? I mean, I'm throwing that out there, but uh -huh. it's a lot. I've never met anybody who hasn't, let's put it that way. Wow. I've oh never met anybody who said, yeah, I'm on Paxil and, you know, I feel horny. I mean, it's just never happened. <laughs> Maybe that could be another book. Um, <laughs> uh, so, so, yeah, so uh, why, you know, knowing, knowing this, knowing the side effects, that they work for a lot of people, yet there's, there's a lot of side effects, uh, why haven't they come up with something better? I mean, Prozac came out, I don't know how many years ago. Why 30 there years been, ago. you know, better and better kind of medications out there? That's a good question. Um, I mean, why is Zyprexa out there when it kills you, you know? I mean, like, what, you'd think they could come up with something that didn't make your triglycerides, you know, go to 800. Um, and you'd think that they could come up with an anti, there are antidepressants out there that don't have sexual side effects. Well, butrin is one of them, but it's not an SSRI. Um, they haven't come up with anything better because they can't. Um, where, what psychiatry is looking to now are the psychedelics actually. That's what they're looking towards now. Mm -hmm. um, there aren't any drugs in the pipeline. There's no SSRIs in the pipeline that are gonna come out that are that are gonna have no sexual side effects. That's not in that's that's not happening right now and I don't foresee it happening in the future. 
And and you, I've written a little bit about the psychedelics and how they they help with depression. And you also write about about that. So can you kind of explain for us like how exactly taking something like magic mushrooms or MDMA can help you get over a really deep depression? Well, actually, um, uh, psilocybin, which is the active ingredient in magic mushrooms, um, has been tested for treatment-resistant depression in England by a, a psychologist by the name of David Nutt. Um, but for the most part, what they're using magic mushrooms for is for people who have anxiety relating to a terminal cancer diagnosis. Um, it is, it's amazing that, first of all, I don't know who wouldn't have anxiety relating to a terminal cancer diagnosis. I just think that's strange. Like that, but you have to somehow qualify for the study. I mean, I think you have to be like climbing the walls with it. I don't know what you need to do, but um, people who have a terminal cancer diagnosis who are facing their own mortality in a very imminent way, when given psilocybin um, in a medical setting, when they've been prepared for it, um, when they know exactly why they're taking it, they're taking it in order to confront their own death. That's, that's a known thing. It's very clear in their minds. Um, it dissolves the fear of death. Um, people come to understand under the influence of psilocybin that they come to believe that this is what we have here is not a, at all what is it that, that there's much more out there people come to know this viscerally they believe it deeply um, that death is not an ending it's a continuation it's a it's it's I don't know because I haven't taken psilocybin but they they have this this deep belief that they are going to continue in some form um, after their death and they, they're no longer afraid of it. I mean, I almost think of it as like an epidural for death. Like we have, you know, we have, we have a pain reliever for birth and it works really well. Um, and psilocybin is in some ways like an epidural for death. It allows people to die, um, not joyfully, but with, surrounded by love and, and, and in peace. Um, and so that's pretty, that's a pretty amazing, that's a pretty amazing thing. It's an, it's like an existential medication. And you know, and I've, uh, they're also using it for quitting smoking, right? And yes, they are using, other... they're yeah. using, <laughs> yeah, yeah, well actually smoking Fear is, a, and quitting smoking, yeah. um, <laughs> they've, they've used psilocybin for other things too. Roland Griffiths at Johns Hopkins has studied psilocybin extensively and he did a study, um, where he gave, I forget the specifics of it, but he gave, you know, let's say 30 people, no, it wasn't that many, but he gave a, a number of people psilocybin and then questioned them later about their experiences. And most of the people who were in that study said that their experience on psilocybin rated as one of like the top three experiences in their lives. They all had mystical experiences on the drug um, and it changed them profoundly. Um, so that's, you know. Yeah, it had lasting effects. Yeah. But why, why are we just now testing those for as depression treatments? Like, why did the drug companies decide, like, let's do stuff with serotonin first, you know, instead of kind of jumping to these more existential drugs. Oh, problem. the drug companies you are not, I'm sure, are not liking the psychedelic business at all because <laughs> there's no money to be made in it. I mean, there's no, you can't patent LSD. I mean, you can't patent a, a mushroom. I mean, it's, um, mushrooms are naturally occurring fungi. I mean, they're, you know, I'm, I'm sure Eli Lilly is not happy to see that psychiatrists are turning to some of the, you know, old or even ancient drugs. Um, so yeah, the dr it's not the drug companies who are looking at psychedelics, it's researchers in university settings who are looking towards the psychedelics. And they're finding that, you know, that psilocybin helps people to die um, in, in a way that is more meaningful and connected than they would have died otherwise. And they're finding that ketamine um, resolves people's depressions and it does so immediately which is something that's 
very different than like a Prozac or any of the other drugs where you have to wait sometimes six to eight weeks to feel any effect at all. No one knows why that is. But if you take ketamine and you're severely depressed, you have stand a good chance of having a remission right there, in, af right after your infusion. It only lasts for two weeks, um, but then you go back for another infusion. So um, researchers, I think, are probably frustrated with the lack of novel drugs coming through the pipeline. And also, and so are looking to psychedelics, but the, the other thing is, the DEA outlawed psychedelics. The psychedelics were being looked at very seriously for mental health. They were being looked at very seriously in the 1950s, 60s, and even early 70s. There were a lot of exper experiments being done with LSD and psilocybin and MDMA. MDMA was a little later. but um, And then the problem was the drugs leached out of the labs and got into the streets, and they became part of the 1960s counterculture. And the DEA finally shut the door on everything and labeled psychedelics as drugs that had no meaningful, nothing meaningful could come from them. I mean, they were put <laughs> on something called Schedule, I think it was Schedule 1. I, it's, yeah. The schedules are too complicated to explain, but they had no relevance for research or for, um, for humanity at all in any way, and they were completely outlawed. And that went on for many, many years. And it's only now that sort of the stain of the 60s is kind of starting to fade. And researchers are very tentatively saying, hey, maybe we better take a look again at these drugs. They do so with great like, caution because they're afraid of being seen as hippy dippy or whatever. Like they want people to know that they are not you know, this is not LSD and a punch bowl at a party. This is serious science that they're doing. Um, so, like, getting them to talk is, like, getting these, per, you know, these researchers to talk is, like, almost impossible. I mean, they're, you know. I can attest to that. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, well, so I'm going to ask one more question, then we're going to take questions from the audience. Um, so I, I guess I'm wondering, like, whether you have any theories from your, your time practicing as a, as a psychotherapist or just from researching all of this, like, why is there so much depression in, like, the wealthiest country in the world? Yeah, you know, that's a good question. With a relatively high quality of life. <laughs> I mean, here's, here's another way of putting that question. When, when uh, drugs... When penicillin was, was uh, discovered, people dying from infections dropped rapidly until now it's, it's rather rare, although we are getting superbugs and stuff like that. But when drugs for um, tuberculosis were discovered, the rates of tuberculosis dropped off sharply, and now like no one dies from tuberculosis. When drugs for depression were discovered, did depression drop off steeply? No. In fact, the rates are just going up. So why is it that we have, according to drug companies and according to many psychiatrists and according to many people, many, just many people in general, why is it that we have these supposedly superior drugs for combating depression and anxiety, and yet the rates of depression and anxiety are only climbing? That doesn't make any sense. They should be going down, right? But they're not. So. What, I mean, what, what do we make of that? I mean, that's, uh, to me, that's, uh, that's um, cause for real concern. I mean, is it, are the drugs that we're taking for depression, are they doing something to our brains that could be making us, in fact, more depressed in some way? Um, I don't know. I know they're very hard to come off of. Um, and I know that before you take a drug, even though you're extremely depressed or anxious, there's nothing wrong with your brain that anyone can see at this point in time. But after you take a drug, like an SSRI, your brain is functioning in a decidedly abnormal fashion. It is not normal to have serotonin sitting for a length of time in the synaptic cleft before it's reuptake into its next neurotrans into its next neuron. Um, so what we know is that millions of people are walking around with abnormally functioning brains stoked on serotonin and that the rates of depression are rising. Um, and it, it could be that 
somehow these drugs are contributing to depression, or it could be that, you know, it could be something less sinister that, you know, more and more the stigma of depression is receding and more and more people are claiming they have it. Um, I, I don't know, but, um, but all I know is that we have treatment for depression and anxiety, treatment that works at least two thirds of the time, and yet more and more people are getting ill. Um, and that our brains on these medications are, 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 are functioning in an abnormal fashion. On that scary note, does anyone have questions? Uh, be sure to use the microphones, yeah. Hi, um, I appreciate your research. Um, I just want to say you're such a beautiful and moving writer. Oh, thank well, you. I just am very astounded by your writing. Um, what do you think about Daniel Amen and his spec scans? Uh, oh. Because you were saying that there's no tissue to look at, and his whole thing is he's got 100,000 functional specs and scans, and he can locate exactly where somebody is having trouble, and he can apply a drug looking at that brain. Yeah, scan. I don't believe he charges so much money for those brain scans. Um, but I have trouble, uh, like, give, feeling, I don't think he's credible. Okay. I think it's a business scam. All right, thank you. Thanks very much for a very interesting presentation. I want to try to clarify for, for myself, I don't know of anybody else, the, um, something about the trend in depression that you just referred to towards the end here. Um, you're saying that uh, we have, have apparently an increase in the rate of depression, incidence of depression in the population over a period of time, but, and it's unclear whether, what role the drugs themselves play in this. And it seems to me one useful statistic here, and I'm wondering if this exists, would be just the rate at which people report depression for the first time, people who have not been on any drug, and so that the reporting rate wouldn't have anything to do with, um, with, the, uh, with the drugs that exist. It would have to do presumably just with kind of whatever causes depression in the first place. And, whether there's some sort of societal explanation for that, or, or, um, yeah, you well actually you had one hypothesis that does seem like it might help answer, and that is that the stigma, with a declining stigma, maybe we have an incidence and in, rising incidence of people coming for the first time who haven't taken the drug. So can you help out here? What is the trend in? Is it in the initial? Oh, I see what reporting you're of it, or is it in just the continue the overall fraction of people that are uh, depressed, whether they're on drugs or not on drugs? It's in the initial reporting of it. There's more and more people. Well, for instance, if you look at SSI or an SSDI, Social Security Disability Income, there is more and more people who um, are getting SSDI or SSI for depression. Um, now, then there were, I mean, there were very few people in the 1960s or whatever where, who would get Social Security disability income for depression. Um, and now there's, it's, it's not common, but there's like hundreds and thousands more cases of that. So those aren't people reporting it for the first time, but people, who, the statistics show that people, um, are, that the number of people reporting depression for the first time is going up. It's not just that there's more depressed people out there, but that newcomers to depression are, um, there's more and more of them. So, and that the people who are already depressed are staying on the, their drugs for long periods of time. It's not just like, I mean, Eli Lilly, when they, did the testing for Prozac, tested Prozac in six week clinical trials. I don't know anybody who takes an SSRI for six weeks. So Pro Eli Lilly said, this is what we found in six weeks. We found no dangerous side effects or dangerous side effects occurring in like 0.110% of the number of people. But the problem is people stay on, if you're put on an SSRI, you can pretty much expect that you're gonna stay on it. Um, and we have no, this is different from what you were saying, but we have no long-term data on what that drug is doing to you, to your brain. Um, and 
it's been 30 years now, so someone could be doing some studies. So I guess this just brings me to another question. Where are, why are there no studies? To me, that does seem sinister as well. Like, I'm a little worried that Eli Lilly is a little worried about what they might find if they actually did look at people's brains after marinating in serotonin for a decade or two, or, or like me, three or four even. Uh, it's been a long time. Thank you for your very interesting talk. Could you say a little bit about um, any genetic uh, linkage for serious mental illness? Is there any research on a national level or international level using, you hear a lot about gene therapy now, is there anything for mental health? And could you also address electroshock therapy? Is it common, is it effective? Um, a study just came out the other day that CNN reported on. I didn't read the study, I just read the CNN report saying that they had found genetic markers, common genetic markers for bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, and autism, that those three syndromes seem to share a common genetic marker, but I mean, it, it, you know, but there's so many genes at play in these syndromes that, um, I mean, they're not going to find a gene. I don't think that's going to happen. But, um, I mean, it does. I mean, by for instance, bipolar disorder is something that seems is commonly handed down from parent to child and so on. I mean, so there does there. It wouldn't surprise me if there were a genetic link. And now there are these markers that they have found. So, um, I mean, it's certainly very, very plausible that there's a genetic component to mental illness, although, you know, environment clearly plays a large role, too. And in terms of electroshock therapy, it's extremely effective um, if you are taking it for severe treatment-resistant depression. If it, it, it works 98 percent of the time. Um, and it's not what it used to be. I mean, it used to be they gave people shock therapy without any kind of uh, tranquilizers at all. And, you know, the person would thrash on the table and there'd be broken bones from the intensity of the seizure. But now the only thing you see in electroshock therapy in terms of a seizure is the big toe will twitch because the person is, has is been given benzodiazepines um, and other tranquilizing drug. So it's, it's, it's not a, you know, horrific treatment anymore by any means, and it is extremely effective, but only for severe depression or OCD. So was Freud wrong about everything? <laughs> I mean, is there an id, a superego, an ego? Is there subconscious? And what role does talking about your mother play? I mean, your child. <laughs> Also, uh, hasn't depression and anxiety gone way up since Trump's been president? <laughs> <laughs> Only a blue state. <laughs> um, I mean, I, th I think that there's a, you know, I mean, I don't think our minds are, have a single layer to them. They're like sedimentary rocks. I mean, there's, there's a top, there's, there's layers. I mean, we have the brain, you know, there's, our brains have what is called limbic, the limbic part of our brain, or the emotional part of our brain. I think that Freud was was probably right in talking about a subconscious or a preconscious, um, and we certainly have what he would call superego, which is um, an internal critic who tells us that we're not doing the right thing, or you know, um, and sometimes that critic guides us in a good way, and other times it just beats us, but. Um, so no, I don't think he was wrong about everything, but I think Freud was more of a novelist than he was a psychiatrist. Mm. I think he generated a lot of um, a lot of really interesting theories that belong more to literature than they do to the to science. Mm. What about Trump? <laughs> <laughs> they said they couldn't treat people with anxiety about Trump because it was real. <laughs> really, that was in the post. And yeah, I mean, well, I mean, you well, can be treated for, Korea. you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, these are all really real things. I mean, that, you know, but, but I mean, you can, you could, if you're really bummed out about Donald Trump and you take Paxil, let's say, or Prozac, you'll probably feel a little bit better. <laughs> he should take it. <laughs> I'm sure he is. Wow. 
So this question about why researchers are not looking into the effects of 30 years of pouring drugs down people's throats is a little curious because we have an enormous medical establishment and what seems to be suggested here is that somehow the drug companies are preventing independent study of something that is an extraordinary um, public health phenomenon. I mean, is that what you're suggesting? Or what? How, how could all these researchers out there who get grants not be able to do this? Um, I, I'm not saying that hasn't happened, but I'm just wondering what the heck's going on. Yeah, I'm wondering too. Well, but you're in touch with a lot of this research community and you're popularizing a lot of research in a very eloquent way. So haven't you gotten some ideas about why people are hiding or you know running away from a very important place where they could make a mark if nothing else as a researcher my god well we have to remember although i don't want to be too cynical here and it's yeah. gotten better but researchers are in with the drug companies i mean they well, are they have been in bed the with board. the drug companies across the board no, no not across the board but yeah um but like psychiatrist donald klein um who isn't you know practices in new york city was quoted saying we haven't done any long, this isn't an exact quote, but we haven't done any long-term studies because we're afraid of what we'll find. Hmm. Um, but just one follow-up. Um, I, I have several friends with deep depression who've tried many drugs over decades, you know, and just not gotten anywhere. And one of them is just trying something called transcranial stimulation. Magnetic stimulation, yeah. Yes, what is that all about? And have you heard anything about whether that has any kind of effect um, beyond what seems to be a horrific procedure you have to go through no it's not i don't think it's that bad they yeah. just pass magnets over your head well i've heard it compared to having pounding in a helmet like over your or something but in any event what have you heard about his effect well if he if that's happening then he's in with the wrong doctor um because it shouldn't there shouldn't be pounding there shouldn't yeah. be helmets involved um <laughs> I'm probably misunderstanding because I wasn't <laughs> present for this treatment, but what have you heard about its effectiveness? Uh, what I've heard about its efficacy is that it's, it's the studies had been done on it, um, and it was deemed to be ineffective for severe treatment-resistant depression or just major depression in general. Um, that and vagal nerve, vagus nerve stimulation, which is another one. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's going to be ineffective for your friend. First of all, there's a placebo response that's huge i mean i think drug companies they they bemoan the placebo because their drugs don't beat the placebo but they i mean the placebo is more effective than the drug so they should just start i think they should just start marketing placebos for people but um but tms i mean it's it's very dramatic you know i mean these magnets are going over you and I mean, I think that there could be a, a very robust placebo response to that. I wouldn't tell your friend that, though, but, yeah. My lips are sealed. Hi. It's, Hi. Um, it's so nice to finally meet you. I read all your books. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering, Lauren, if, if you could talk about the impact of your own experience with mental illness on your writing. Do you think you'd be as an amazing writer that you are? without the experience of having gone through such profound struggles with, with mental illness. Um, as we were waiting for you to come tonight, I just turned a page into your new book, and I, I knew I could just turn to any page, and I'd find a paragraph, and it was the page that you write about how you make origami out of your prescription, prescriptions that you get from your, your own doctor, and you hand those to your, you know, the pharmacy, and you watch them turn it into a bottle of pills like it's just absolutely amazing and so my question again is like how has your own experience made you if you think it has such an amazing writer or not and is it like a bi-directional kind of experience um th this might disappoint you um <laughs> Because I really, first of all, thank you. Thank you um, for reading all of my books and for coming here tonight to talk to me. I, I mean, it's hugely, um, I mean, getting to meet people who have read my books and, that my, and knowing that my books have had an impact on someone is very meaningful for me. Um, I do not feel that my struggles with mental illness and those have been substantial. Um, I do not feel that they have benefited my writing at all. Um, I feel that I'm 
the writer that I am in spite of, not because of mental illness. If I didn't have to struggle with, and I still, even though I'm medicated, I still struggle frequently with, de with you know, d with depression, um, like in a daily, sometimes in a daily way. Um, it doesn't do anything, it just exhausts me. Um, I don't find it, you know, some people say, you know, that they can write better when they're depressed, and I just, I don't understand that. Um, I don't, I, I, I just, I don't think that depression and, a, and anxiety have really given me any special insights into the human condition. I think that I have a lot of curiosity and a desire to make things that um, have beauty in them, and so I look at my each one of my books as a chance to make a little world, um, and that's the healthy part of me at work. There, it's not the sick part of me. Last question, I think. So forgive me, I haven't read your books, but I will after this. Um, but if you address this issue in the books, but the tension between talk therapy and medication, you say you're a therapist who I presume works with patients and talk therapy, but you said that didn't really work for you. And then you went on medication, which you believe helped you a lot, but you also talk about, you know, what are the long-term effects we don't know. Do you, how do we resolve this tension between the two types of therapy and is there a way to, is, which one's better, can we say that? I don't think we can say which one's better. I mean, the kind of talk therapy that I do with people is not, I, it's not historically based. I, I don't spend a lot of time going back into a person's past. I mean, I take a history when I first meet a patient. I take a, a history, of, you know, of when did the symptoms start, and you know, I, I, I want to get a full picture. But then it's it's you know, we develop, we um, we look at what the obstacles in the person's life are, and we develop a treatment plan with obtainable and measurable goals. Um, that by such and such a time, such and such a person will be able to do A, B, and C, depending on what their, what, what their issues are. I think that kind of treatment um, can, can be effective hand in hand with medication. Um, so, so do you recommend your patients go on medication? Usually when they come to me, they already are on medication, okay. but I would, I would recommend if I had a patient who was in, a, and I have had patients before who are either in a severe depression or going into a, a, bi, a manic phase of, in a bipolar illness. Um, I definitely, even though there's so many unknowns, I mean, there's no question for me when someone's going into a bipolar, a manic psychosis, that they, there's no question they need to be on medication, absolutely. Um, and the same for a severe depression. Um, I mean, it's possible the drugs could be harming our brain, but on the other side, and there's always another side, this is the problem, it's so multifaceted, the drugs could be hurting our brain, but depression isn't doing anything good for your brain. You know, in depression, you're bathed in cortisol, which is a stress hormone. I mean, your brain is bathed in it. That's probably not good for you over the long term. So I, you know. You need both, I guess. Same yeah, thing. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you just mentioned mania, and of course you've been talking mostly about depression, uh, and I don't know whether you comment on the effectiveness of drugs for, uh, uh, you know, manic, uh, uh, bipolar, uh, mental disease. I have the impression that they're not as successful, but maybe... Oh, no, they're, um... Lithium, I, I have a, a very long chapter. The second chapter in the book mm -hmm. is on lithium. And lithium is an amazing, lithium is actually an amazing drug. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, um, it's a form of salt. Um, and it works incredibly well in both bipolar disorder and also as an adjunct to therapy for depression. It even it works. Mm -hmm. So, um, so no, I, I mm -hmm. definitely address uh, manic depression or bipolar disorder in the book and the and the uh, the discoveries that John Cade made um, when he discovered that lithium could could work for people with manic depression and what about drug combinations uh, cocktails you know using more than one do you 
go into that. Uh, um. I, I mean, I certainly, I mentioned, certainly mentioned that in the book, but I don't have like a chapter on cocktails, but most people are on some kind of drug cocktail. I mean, it's, it's, I, I don't know exactly the statistics, but it's very common now to treat people with one, you know, as one drug, as, as the SSRI starts to wear out, a psychopharmacologist will try to boost it by giving, say, an, an, uh, an atypical antipsychotic. Um, so they work synergistically together in some fashion. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think that's, oh, okay, okay, <laughs> one last question, okay. I have a book entitled um, One Nation Under Therapy, yeah, in which the course. author is, uh, is concerned about, she subtitled, uh, how the helping industry is undermining our self-reliance. And so my concern is the potential for abuse in labeling people in the society, particularly with minorities, have you? considered that? Tell me more about what you're asking, the potential for abuse of... By labeling people as having depression, because they may be struggling with issues, but it may not necessarily be depression. And since these individuals are in an authoritative position, mm -hmm. there's a tendency for abuse. And, and in many instances, the abuse is discovered long after it's, it has had its negative effect. I don't think that there is um, a, a tendency for treatment providers to label people of, of with different ethnicities or um, to label, to, to give labels of depression more, say, to black people than to white people. There's a, something called the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. Mm -hmm. And you have to you have to meet the criteria for depression, and or you can't just label someone as depressed these days. You you have to meet stringent criteria. Um, so is that a national approach, or is it? Or it's actually becoming an different? international approach. Yeah. The DSM five. It's now on its it's now on its fifth edition. Um, or it may even be the DSM five R. It may be the revised DSM five. I'm not sure. I don't. I haven't kept up with it. Um, it's actually becoming international. All countries are starting to adopt it, which which that is problematic. That all all you know that that you know because there's illnesses that are cult specific to certain cultures, and those illnesses will be sort of wiped out if everybody adopts the United States' view. Right. So of mental it, illness. It may be that they'll be labeled depressed here, but in their culture, they went, may not perceive it as depression. Right. That's true. So, but I'm, I'm still thinking that there is the possibility, as far-fetched as it may seem, for mislabeling people. And if we're not, on, if we're not willing to accept that, then I, I, I think I have an issue with that, because bias is always there. Scientific, as you know, science is not new. Scientific research is not neutral. So it seems yes. to me you always have to keep in mind the bias effect. Yeah. Especially in depression where you still can't do a blood test to see if you're depressed or something. Yeah. Scientific bias is probably more there than in other diseases. But I think when people are severely depressed, they welcome a diagnosis. It's, 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 it's like it's a relief to know, OK, this is what I have. I don't think that people are worried about being labeled as I don't think depressed people are worried that they're going to be adversely labeled. I don't know, maybe they are, but my experience has been more that when people get a psychiatric, they're suffering so severely, and the suffering seems so painful and even absurd to them that to finally get a diagnosis um, and to know that you're not the only person who's felt this way, that there's millions of other people who have had this diagnosis as well, is actually, you know, soothing to people. I mean, we talk a lot about stigma um, and the stigma of these diagnoses, but I don't really see, you know, on, from person to person a lot of stigma. I mean, there's people who, people very freely, it seems to me, just discuss their diagnoses and discuss what drugs they're on. And um, But anyway, I mean, the point was there are illnesses do take on cultural specific, culturally specific forms, and as the DSM leeches out of this country and into all every continent and country in the world, we will lose some of these culturally specific forms of expression. And that, I think, will be a loss. Subjecting the rest of the world to a particular country's definition 
Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Lauren, and thank you all so much for being here. It's a really interesting discussion. Thank you.